Whole countries come here. He acknowledges that he talks tough. We have the right as a people to determine who will make the best American. That's not racist, that's being sensible. We had one of the highest tax rates in the world. We taxed on worldwide income. We've changed that. Workers and their families will receive larger paychecks starting in February. The crumbs that they are giving to workers is so pathetic. Think about how elitist that is. Crumbs. Terry McAuliffe may be running for president. He's talking about how Trump uh, towered over Clinton during one of the debates. What would you do yeah. in a debate with him if he tried that? You'd have to pick him up off the floor. You mean you'd deck him? That guy from Virginia slid <laughs> the entire length of his driveway on black eyes. This video has been seen by 50 million people around the world. Welcome to the home of the world's number one cable morning news show. We have a lot of lights in here, Studio F. And today we have Rachel Campos Duffy in for Ainsley, who has started her, her uh, weekend one day early. Awesome. I'm glad to be here with you guys. And you're going to be back through Monday. And you're going to be back on Monday, too, right? Yep, Monday and over the weekend. So right. hope and you guys don't get tired of me. And I'm going to be talking <laughs> to your husband on uh, on the radio shortly. Good. But he's actually making the trip, too, which meaning it's chaos at home because you have 27 kids. <laughs> and they are basically fending for themselves. Yeah. It'll, be, it'll be like Cat in the Hat at the end of the book before I come home. Everybody's trying to rush and put everything back together. Right. Well, no parties. <laughs> so she knows all about Congress, and that's good because that's our lead story. Yesterday, it was announced that uh, it sounded like certain senators had come up with a deal, a bipartisan deal, uh, to figure out what to do about DACA and immigration. And so they, they sent out that word, then they went to the White House, presented it, and the White House said, not a good deal. Now, during the White House meeting, and here is the New York Times right here, uh, in vulgar terms, Trump disparages some immigrants. That's the way they depict it, uh, because he used uh, a, a word we're not going to obviously use this morning to describe cert a certain country or countries where a number of immigrants have come from. Right. I mean, he was talking about these countries that are very corrupt, crime-ridden, um, have a lot of poverty, and I think it was more a commentary on those governments and those countries and not on the people. Um, but clearly, uh, after having had a great meeting earlier right. in, the, in the week where I think he set the terms of the discussion to be about border security, this has provided a big opening for and Democrats to move the conversation to a more comfortable space for them, which is race. Right. Well, when this first came out, as usual, the people that don't like the president should jumped on it because this is something he shouldn't have said. Congressman Mia Love, among them, she, her, yeah. her family's from Haiti. She said, uh, her parents are from uh, Haiti, uh, called on President Trump to apologize, saying his comments were unkind, divisive, and a list to fly in the face of our nation's values. Right. However, the story has changed somewhat because the president a said, lot. listen, I didn't say that, uh, essentially. That's what I interpret from his tweet. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, about 30 minutes ago, the president tweeted this out. The language used by me at the DACA meeting was tough, but this was not the language used. Repeat, this was not the language used. What was really tough was the outlandish proposal made, a big setback for DACA. Sadly, Democrats want to stop paying our troops and government workers in order to give a sweetheart deal, not a fair deal for DACA. Take care of our military and our country first. We had Steve Cortez on with us uh, just about uh, a half an hour ago, asked him about the comments and what it does to the conversation, and he said this. Troubled countries in the world, of course, and do the citizens of those countries want to come to America? Of course they do, and that's a wonderful thing. And I say that, by the way, as a son of an immigrant from Latin America, and by the way, he came from a place that was troubled and corrupt and dangerous and poor, and he found the opposite in America, and thank God he did. And we should always be that refuge uh, for, for those people, and we have the right as a people to determine who will make the best Americans, who brings the drive, the skills, the love of our values and our constitution that will make America better. That's not racist, that's being sensible. Here's what's good. You have both sides working together. Even when they were working on the tax plan, they've been meeting as early uh, in late October and November. And among those people, and it was a rotation, but the ones that presented this to the president were Lindsey Graham, Dick Durbin, Jeff Flake, Michael Bennett of Colorado, Bob Menendez. So they were all the ones who gave the proposal in. But they were surprised to find out there were some other people in with the president when they made the proposal, including Tom Cotton, who the president obviously really respected.
ex-military guy, Ivy League education, who is hard line on this. And he basically says this doesn't give nearly enough resources to meet the president's demands. He was dismissive. Right. He says uh, this is not going to do it. When Lindsey Graham came back and said, uh, Senator Cotton can present his proposal. We presented ours. I'm not negotiating with Senator Cotton. And let me know when Senator Cotton has a proposal that gets right. a single Democrat. Well, he goes, that, uh, I'm dying to look at it. And that's true. It's easy for both sides to say what they believe. But who is going to come together and compromise? Right. And while all the other networks are talking about what the president said, his vulgar comments. Apparently uh, didn't say. Or, or maybe didn't say. Um, let's talk about what, what the deal was that was presented by Durbin mm -hmm. and Lindsey Graham. So the deal says, give Dreamers path to citizenship. It gives Dreamers parents three-year work permits, um, gives the president only $1.6 billion of the $18 billion he requested for a border structure, and that comes with new restrictions. It does end the diversity lottery program. President Trump, the author of Art of the Deal, says no deal. But I will say that I also spoke to um, several members of Congress who said this was a non-starter for them. Well, too. absolutely. I mean, the president, remember a couple of days ago when we showed all 55 minutes of it where he brought in the Democrats and the Republicans and he started negotiating on camera, essentially. We all saw that. But then what, was com uh, what came together with, with these six bipartisan senators was just kind of a, a mush. It, it wasn't quite what the president wanted. It wasn't quite, actually, it was what the Democrats wanted. It, yeah. Yeah, it was a good deal for them. I think so. So <laughs> essentially, the president sees the, the thing yesterday and goes, okay, so the Democrats are getting everything they want. Where where do I get all the lottery? Yeah, he got the lottery. He got it into the lottery system. But remember, this was a, 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 a not a leadership-appointed group. This yeah. was a self-appointed group. They got together. God there are other him. people getting together. Um, but if this is no deal, there's going to have to be another group. So when the president said, if they get me a deal, I'll sign it, because he knows it's going to have to be vetted through the House, conservative House, and Senate uh, before it gets to him. So he knows it's going to be fixed before it got there. But at least they're talking and moving forward. Now, about Mexico paying for it, earlier in the day, it's easy to get swamped by this. Uh, four Wall Street Journal reporters uh, were into, gave an interview to the president at the White House, and he talked about, hey, wasn't Mexico going to pay for the wall? He says, well, you know, I'm renegotiating NAFTA, right? He said, if mm -hmm. they don't pay me flat out ahead of time, we're going to get it through renegotiating of NAFTA. Right. That's where the money's going to come from. Ultimately, there were a number of uh, prominent conservative Republicans uh, after the president made his uh, comments before the TV cameras 55 minutes long in the uh, White House a couple of days ago. People were going, man, if the president agrees to something that is not what he promised us, we're going to, you know, he's lost us. Well, by the president essentially saying, go back to the drawing board, this is not something I'm going to sign, I think this should buoy them in knowing that he has a hard line and it was not met with this deal. Right, and I think this, you know, I think we all have to be honest. The comment, whether he said it or not, the media is running with it, and I do think it's provided an opening for Democrats, who I think were in a very bad position earlier this week, where they were sort of forced to confront some very common sense uh, talk from the president in his meeting, and now it's back onto racial uh, grounds, well, which, and, and I think that that's a problem for the president because, you know, he needs this deal to come through. Well, plus, also, it was a closed-door meeting. Somebody leaked this initially to the uh, Washington Post. Yeah. Whoever was in that room uh, had hoped the president would like the plan. Didn't right. like it. Ultimately, then they leaked this to a staff member. Or somebody got it to the Washington Post, and it's been confirmed by Fox. Uh, didn't like the president's Well, one thing that Americans do approach. like is that Donald Trump's uh, economy and the tax reform bill that was recently passed is bringing uh, business back to America. Fiat Chrysler adds um, uh, 2,500 uh, jobs, and they're moving jobs from Mexico back to the United States. That's right. They're going to... Uh, Redevelop the Warren, Michigan plant. They're going to put a billion dollars into it. And starting in 2020, it's going to become a heavy duty truck plant. They're going to do the Ram heavy duty truck. Uh, also, it looks as if the uh, employees, about 60,000 of them across the country for Fiat Chrysler, will wind up with a thousand dollar bonus. That's great. It's yeah. amazing. Hey, Jillian. So you have some other news besides the economy. Good morning. Good Biggest morning. news of the day. It's Good Friday. Morning. So, yay. <laughs> <laughs> Aside from that, we, <laughs> we only have 50 more minutes, and then it's more time. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But we do have a Fox News alert, guys, that we want to get to. So let's get you caught up on this. Brand new chilling dispatch audio just in moments after a murder suspect ambushed officers right outside their police department. 
We have an officer down. Officer down. We got officer in the back of the vehicle. We are heading to the hospital. Authorities in Charlotte, North Carolina say Jonathan Bennett drove up to a group of at least six officers in the parking lot and started shooting. One officer hit in the leg before police returned fire, killing Bennett. Also breaking right now, grow a pair of ovaries. That's the message from Arizona Congresswoman Martha McSally to the GOP. Her strong words in a new political ad launching her campaign for U.S. Senate. I'm a fighter pilot and I talk like one. That's why I told Washington Republicans to grow a pair of ovaries and get the job done. Now, McSally I'm hoping to replace Arizona's retiring GOP Senator Jeff Flake. In just a few hours, President Trump will undergo his first checkup as Commander-in-Chief. He's heading to Walter Reed Military Hospital for a number of tests to assess his health. The 71-year-old says he thinks it will go very well. Press Secretary Sarah Sanders says the White House will provide a readout of the exam. And as you recall, during the campaign, then-candidate Trump's doctor said he would be, quote, the healthiest individual ever elected to the presidency. This story is amazing. A six-year-old boy who survived the Sutherland Springs Church Massacre heading home in style. More than two months later, Ryland Ward, who was shot five times, is finally leaving the hospital. And the person that picked him up? The first responder that saved his life. I was the one that pulled him out of the church. Ryland's eyes just kept looking at me, never, never took his eyes off of me, reached out for my hand. I knew from there it was going to be a special bond. Mm, just gives you chills, doesn't it? Little Ryland is the last survivor to leave the hospital after a gunman opened fire on a Texas church congregation, leaving 26 innocent people dead, including Ryland's stepmom and two sisters. Isn't that incredible, guys? Oh, what a story. I know. Get a ride home. Yep. All right. Thank you, Jillian. Thank you, Jillian. Mm -hmm. um, did Fusion GPS founder Glenn Simpson try casting doubt on the FBI investigation into Hillary Clinton's email? Well, Peter Schweitzer, the author of Clinton Cash, sure thinks so, and he joins us next. Plus, Ben Shapiro still ahead right here on Fox and Friends. Eighteen, 16 minutes after 8 o'clock here in New York City, transcripts just released this week with testimony from the firm behind that anti-Trump dossier. Fusion GPS founder Glenn Simpson revealing they found the FBI reopening the Hillary uh, email case concerning so much so that Christopher Steele reached out to the FBI. Here with his take is author of Clinton Cash, Peter Schweizer. Peter, good morning to you. Hey, good morning. So, you know, uh, during the testimony, that, uh, thanks to Diane Feinstein, she uh, just uh, leaked out to everybody, even though parts of it were redacted so much for transparency. Uh, the Fusion people try to present themselves as just disinterested, essentially nonpartisans. But that's not the case, is it? No, that's exactly right. And I think what this testimony shows, Steve, is that, you know, they're not the research firm they led on, which is essentially that all they were interested in doing was, you know, concerns about Trump and Russia ties. Uh, they were actually upset that the FBI reopened the Hillary Clinton email case. Um, and, and so much so that they even suspended cooperating with the FBI, according to Glenn Simpson's testimony. Uh, you know, my point would be that has nothing to do with this research area you say you're so interested interested in. And I think it's just further confirmation that the purpose of Fusion GPS was not just fact sharing or right. passing along this, this, this dossier. There were other parts of their agenda as well. Well, and part of it is it, when you're doing opposition research, the, the way it works is you find some dirt or in this case, maybe you make up a bunch of stuff because you're getting paid <laughs> for it by the, by the pound, apparently. Uh, you, you present a dossier to your candidate, okay, here's the stuff, here's the dirt on my person, right. and if the candidate doesn't use it, you pass it to the press, and the press is going to run with it if they can verify it, and that's been the problem, couldn't verify it. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. And look, I mean, Glenn Simpson, in his testimony that was just released, he talks about the fact that what Fusion GPS does, Steve, is collect public open source information and connect dots. Right. Well, I kind of do the same thing as a journalist. The problem is the Trump dossier, the Steele dossier, has absolutely no public source information in it. Uh, and, Steel, and, and, and Simpson even says in his testimony that they didn't even try to verify it independently. So to me, this has all the markings, of, frankly, of political dirty tricks rather than any kind of serious research effort. I could never imagine putting together a salacious uh, dossier on someone based totally on second or third hand you know, sure. anonymous accounts and then not even trying to verify it. So, you know, it just it just further shows that this, I think, was a dirty tricks operation more than it was some fact finding operation by Fusion GPS. And Peter, I'm sure you heard Sarah Carter, the investigative reporter, uh, say earlier this week that apparently the dossier, which was largely completely unverified and untrue at this point, was used in part to get a FISA warrant to spy on the Trumps. So if that is true, where opposition research from one political campaign was used to launch a federal investigation, essentially, into your opponent, this would stack very high in the list of uh, greatest political scandals of all time. <laughs> It, it would. I mean, it's it's really uh, the ultimate dirty trick, because not only did they use this dossier to leak to media outlets right. uh, that Trump had all these vulnerabilities with the Russians, they also triggered an FBI investigation, yeah. which they also leaked to the press. It's something, but it sounds like a lot of the dots are being connected. I think someday we'll know what happened. Uh, if you want to know about the Clinton Foundation, he wrote a great book. It's called Clinton Cash. Peter Schweizer from down in Tallahassee today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. All right. Oh, boy. Meanwhile, 820 here in New York City, it's an iconic symbol, the Gateway Arch, named after Thomas Jefferson. But now two senators want to scrub Jefferson's name from it. A local radio host says it's ridiculous, and she will join us next. Right, some quick headlines starting with a Fox News alert. New clues that North Korea could be preparing for a nuclear missile test. New satellite images showing significant activity at the rogue nation's testing site, which includes underground tunnels. Several hundred reportedly died in the passageways late last year. And in just a few hours, the White House expected to announce its decision regarding sanctions against Iran in the nuclear agreement. Now, while President Trump could continue relief put in place by the deal, he is expected to impose new, tougher sanctions. He has repeatedly slammed the Obama-era program as, quote, the worst deal ever, end quote, and has called on Congress to fix it or withdraw. Brian? All right. It's one of the most recognizable sites in the St. Louis area. The Gateway Arch officially located in the Jefferson National Expansion Memorial. But now two senators want to scrub... Jefferson's name from the memorial and rename it the Gateway Arch National Park. Here with reaction, Stacy Washington, an Air Force veteran, columnist, conservative columnist, and a very good talk, radio talk show host in St. Louis, and joins us right now. Stacy, first off, what started this movement? Well, it really isn't a movement. There haven't been protests on this. There haven't been a lot of uh, huge major conversations here locally. Um, it's a bipartisan issue. You have uh, senators and, and House reps on both sides of the aisle who are bringing these bills up in both chambers to get the name changed. And I think that the primary driver is just convenience, because most people don't call it the Jefferson National Expansion Memorial. They call it the Gateway Arch or the Arch. Do, so. you, feel, do you feel as though people have an obligation to keep our founding fathers' names alive, especially as one indispensable as Thomas Jefferson? I do. I actually am a little surprised by the fact that we, we actually have bipartisan support and that it's something that they're moving on in light of the really systemic issues facing the city of St. Louis, namely, number one, for per capita murder, uh, declining population in the city and county areas, major corporations leaving, um, the taxes that they continually increase in the city and, and kind of impose on the remainder of the, the metro area. There are a lot of issues here, Brian, and I, I just kind of, I'm a little baffled by this being a, an 
action that they're all taking. I love this. Uh, thank goodness visitors can now avoid honoring those who brought white privilege to the plains and can, uh, and can purchase made in China art souvenirs with no reminder of the author of the Jefferson Democracy, uh, one lawmaker said sarcastically. Listen, nobody said our founding fathers were perfect, but we would not have a country without them, and they need to be remembered. What is so hard to understand about this generation of Americans? You know, I, I think it's kind of funny because if you think about how you get to, from point A to point B, it's always a journey, right, Brian? So we get from the founding fathers to a country as diverse and fantastic as the one we have now by the bumps in the road. And these weren't deities. They were human beings. So, yes, he owns slaves. Yes, he has a very complicated history. But that's what makes him interesting. And I'm glad for all of it. If anything were different then it wouldn't be what it is now. So I'm, I'm proud to be an American, proud to be here in St. Louis, Missouri, proud to have the Jefferson National Expansion Monument. And I just think we could spend that effort and the money that will be used to change the signs and all of that on better things. They just had a monument evaluation committee in New York City. It fell flat on its face. They said they want to add some plaques to uh, Columbus or add some context to Teddy Roosevelt. Go ahead. But you cannot mess with our past. You learn from it. They were imperfect people, but man, they did a lot of great things like doubling the size of the country, authoring the Declaration of Independence, uh, third president of the United States, first secretary of state, the vice president. You could not have a country without him. I cannot believe in 2017, we still at 2018, we have to debate this. But thanks so much for your service and, and for uh, speaking out about it. Thanks, Brian. I agree with you wholeheartedly. <laughs> All right. Uh, and we should snap out of it. We're becoming a very arrogant generation. Coming up straight ahead. So how far did President Obama go to secure the Iranian deal? Did his administration tip off a terrorist set up for assassination, one who was running the Iraqi revolution, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard? The bombshell new report. Ben Shapiro will talk about it next. All right, uh, we're coming from Studio F here in the heart of Midtown Manhattan. Welcome aboard, Fox and Friends. Ben Shapiro is the editor-in-chief of DailyWire.com, a syndicated columnist and the host of The Ben Shapiro Show. He joins us right now from the West Coast. Ben, good morning to you. Morning. I'm sure you've been watching. Uh, it's a feeding frenzy on some of the other channels regarding what the president may or may not have said yesterday when he was uh, in that DACA deal. Uh, and it was reported by the Washington Post initially that he said a word we're not going to use on this program, referring to certain countries. But the president then tweeted this out about an hour ago. He said, the language used by me at the DACA meeting was tough, but this was not the language used. What was really tough was the outlandish proposal made a big setback for DACA. All right, so we've set the table. Where would you like to start? <laughs> well, I mean, I think that we, we can start with the denial. Uh, we, it's unclear, you know, whether this was said or not. Now the president has denied it. Right. I would have preferred that if he was going to deny it, he did it right away, obviously, rather than waiting 15 hours to do so, because obviously things sort of blew up in the meantime. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the, the comments that he's accused of saying, there are really two comments that, that he made, right? There's the one where he said, why are we letting all these people from bleep whole countries into the country? Uh, and then he said something about all these Haitians, they, they should be deported or something, so, something along those Get lines. Him out. The second accusation. Yeah, to get him out. So something like that. That second accusation seems less well substantiated than the first in terms of the sourcing that the Washington Post used. And it's the second accusation that I think is, is worse uh, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, the first comment that the, the, there, are, there, there are a lot of reasons people seem offended this morning. One is the idea that Trump said some countries are bleep holes. Uh, to be fair to the president, some countries are really crappy, right? In Sudan, <laughs> North Korea. Haiti is not a great place to live. It has a life expectancy of 63 years and an average you know, annual GDP per capita of like 730 bucks. It's not a great place to live. So, and, and the cursing, is it something that we love? Nobody said it behind closed doors, unlike Joe Biden, who actually said on a live mic that <laughs> President Obama's Obamacare deal was a big effing deal, right? So right. The, the vulgarity, I find the media is jumping up and down over that a little bit extreme, considering that they're happy to actually say the word that none of us are saying on air right now over and over on other networks. Yeah. Uh, the, the second question is whether he's actually saying that people from bad countries should not come to the United States because 
there's some, for some nefarious reason. Now, there are two reasons why you could say that people from those countries shouldn't come over or shouldn't be privileged in, for example, the diversity visa lottery program. The first reason is not actually bigoted, right? That's the idea that depending on the country that you are from, you may not be as well able to assimilate. And that's not a black-white thing. If you're from Russia, maybe you're not as able to assimilate easily as if you're from Great Britain. And in this case, the president's choices of countries are really unfortunate because when he contrasts Haiti and Norway, it gives people the ability to say, well, he's meaning black and white, mm -hmm. when really all that he means is maybe assimilation rates aren't the same from different countries, which well, seems ben, you know, I'll relatively... Well, further than that. Norway was here 48 hours ago. The president, that was on the forefront of his mind, number one. And number two, per capita income is through the roof. So they, they say right. that in terms of term, uh, quality of living, but people saw it in black and white. Right, exactly. So, so I, I think that's correct. The second way of reading it is the, the way that, which imputes bigotry to the president. I think it requires a little bit of a jump, and that's the idea. The president was saying we don't want people from these, these bleephole countries because they're bleephole people. And I think that the media are, are taking it that way. Again, I think that requires a little bit of a leap. I'm not sure that that's exactly what the president was saying. And without his exact wording and without any context as to what he was saying, right. you know, I, I think that how, how you view this is a Rorschach test on how you view the president. If you want him to be seen as a bigot, if right. you think he's a bigot already, you're going to jump to he's a bigot from these comments. Right. If you don't think he's a bigot, you're going to say, that's not what he meant by this at all. Now, would I prefer he had not said this? Of course. But that's true about, like, half the stuff the president <laughs> says for me, so. That's fair, Ben. This is Rachel uh, Campbell Stuffy talking to you. I agree. Listen, I think some of our best immigrants have come from crappy governments uh, and countries, so I I'm you know, a little bit perplexed by that, hoping he didn't actually say that. Um, that said, you know, when is he going to stop trusting the Democrats? I mean, we all say irreverent things, um, you know, un-PC things when we think we're in a private setting. But gosh, I mean, he probably should know by now that um, the Democrats are out for blood. I mean, no question that if you're going to say stuff like this, uh, it, it's not particularly smart to say it in front of people who are not your political allies. You shouldn't right. say stuff like this to begin with, as you mentioned. And, and you're exactly right. One of the arguments in favor of bringing in people from bad countries is that they know what they're leaving. Right. right. And a lot of our best immigrants are coming from places that are quite so, terrible, including my great grandparents when they came over. And I think pretty much everybody in the country's great grandparents came over from somewhere, right. somewhere they considered bad, including the pilgrims. So the sure. idea that that, you know, that, that that line works. But but you're right that, you know, the president, it, it, I, I swear, if the man could just stay off Twitter and watch his mouth, he would rise five points in the approval ratings almost immediately. And the proof of this is that every time he goes out of the country and he doesn't have access to Twitter and he doesn't actually speak to the press and he's not talking to Democrats, his approval ratings rise five to ten points. And he does actually very good in these settings, in these international That's settings right. as well. Sure. All right, so let's talk about Nancy Pelosi if we can, because she's getting a total pass here about what she says about the money that so-called average people are making and getting increases off this uh, economic plan and how she described the meeting that was held without her. First off, when she was told that uh, $1,000 bonuses were being handed out and places like Walmart were, were raising up their minimum wage, this was her reaction. In terms of the bonus that corporate America received versus the crumbs that they are giving to workers to kind of put the schmooze on is so pathetic. Hmm. Crumbs to put the schmooze on. Could you please, you live in California, can you explain what she's talking about? No, I, no. No. <laughs> I have no idea what she's talking about. Uh, you know, as, as a Jewish person who uses the word schmooze pretty regularly, you, you don't put the schmooze on. That's, that's not actually a thing. Uh, and, uh, and beyond that, you know, when, when Nancy Pelosi says that people who are low income and getting raises from, from because of the president's tax cuts and the Republican tax cuts, when, when she says that that doesn't mean anything for those people, that's pretty derogatory toward people who she's supposed to be courting. I mean, I think the mm -hmm. whole problem for the Democrats is they didn't win a lot of blue-collar votes in places like Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. And now they're going around saying that if you get a thousand bucks back from your employer, you get a raise from your employer, it doesn't mean anything because it's not enough money. And Dude. maybe she should stop hanging out in Marin right. County and start hanging out in, in rural Ohio. Now, well, the second thing we wanted to bring up is what she said about the meeting that was taking place without her. The highest mark, uh, the highest ranking person there was Steny Hoyer. Nancy Pelosi came out and said, what, what do you mean, that meeting? With a bunch of white guys, five maybe white guys. Uh, five white guys. Maybe they should open up some type of other stand. I don't even know what that means. But Steny Hoyer was offended. I mean, is is that? Is, I mean, we're, number one, do people have to worry about her stability? 
Uh, well, I mean, I'm not sure that Nancy Pelosi has been all there for a while, but I'm not going to play Artem Church, a psychiatrist. I think the voters are going to have to decide whether or not they, they want Nancy Pelosi representing them. And in San Francisco, apparently they do. But, uh, but Nancy Pelosi you know, doing this, this routine about inter, you know, intersectionality with regard to congressional leadership. Well, the negotiations definitely would have gone differently if Nancy Pelosi were there. She's going to have to explain why she would have negotiated any differently than Steiny Hoyer, who's her deputy. And I'm, I'm just confused. Is she, is she on a different page than Steiny Hoyer? Did Trump not invite her because she's a woman? Is that the implication? Because that seems... Pretty, pretty stupid, actually. Well, maybe uh, President Trump should put the schmooze on her then uh, <laughs> and invite her next time. Uh, one other thing we wanted to ask you about, and apparently there is a, re a newspaper report that the Obama administration tipped off Iranian terrorists that Israel planned to assassinate him just because they wanted to make sure the Iran nuke deal, uh, a Barack Obama legacy item, went through. Well, it wouldn't be the most surprising story. This comes from Haaretz, which is an Israeli newspaper that's usually well-sourced. They're reporting it secondhand based on another mm -hmm. report. Ben Rhodes, the former national security advisor, essentially, to President Obama, uh, apparently quasi-denied it on, on Twitter. But it wouldn't be a particular surprise for the Obama administration to be making provision for Iranian terrorists, considering there's an entire political report from Europe all about how they had done so for Hezbollah because they wanted to pay off the Iranian regime mm -hmm. in order so they could ram through this nuclear deal. So... Your, your hackles always have to be up. Your, your, your kind of antenna have to be up whenever there's a story about the Obama administration trying to bend over backwards to help mm. evil people on behalf of that Iran nuclear deal. They were lying to the American people continuously about it, of course. Ben, if this is true, this is the most powerful person in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard who is responsible really tangentially for many American deaths. This, that would be, you talk about a foreign policy disaster that needs to be investigated, Soleimani. Uh, this guy, we basically, we told him he's not allowed to leave the country, yet he turned up in Russia. So this, this would be something uh, extraordinary if this is proven correct. It definitely would be a bombshell. And one of the things that's amazing is Tommy Veter, who, of course, used to be a member of the Obama administration, apparently not when this, this story was broken. He came out and he said, well, why exactly is everybody so exercised? It's not like this guy Soleimani was like Osama bin Laden or something. That demonstrates the gap in understanding about terrorism that the Obama administration evidenced nearly every day in office. Absolutely. All right. All right. Uh, joining us today from the West Coast, Ben, thanks for getting up early. Have a great weekend. Thanks, yeah, thanks ben. a lot. All right. It is 18 minutes before the top of the hour, and Jillian joins us with news from Cuba. That's right. Good Friday morning to you guys, to you at home as well. Let's get you caught up on some of your headlines, starting with this. 11 Gitmo detainees are suing President Trump. They claim they're being illegally held at the military prison in Cuba just for being Muslim and that the president wants to keep them there forever. Lawyers using some of the president's tweets as evidence, including this one, saying there should be no further releases from Gitmo. The detainees want to be charged or set free. The latest social media craze now drawing strong warnings from the medical world. Doctors saying the laundry pod challenge where people eat those tiny detergent filled packets can lead to a number of problems, including burns to the skin, eyes and respiratory tract. Procter & Gamble, which manufactures some of the packs, also expressing concern over the stunt. Vice President Pence taking time out of his busy schedule to pose for a selfie with U.S. military members in Las Vegas. The second in command also visiting Nellis Air Force Base, where he delivered an inspiring pep talk to troops. Be ready. Mind your mission. Take care of one another. Train as never before. The American people are counting on you. Pence in town for the grand opening of AFWorks. It's a nonprofit workspace that brings small businesses and innovators together to come up with technology solutions for the Air Force. As a look at your headlines, I'll send it back to you guys. Taking some selfies. Yep. Thanks, Jillian. Right. Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, straight ahead, we're switching gears. The video is very disturbing. A hospital patient dumped by security guards at a bus stop in freezing cold weather wearing only a gown. How does that happen? A live report next. And thanks to the president's tax plan, the owner of this car dealership is passing on the savings to his employees. He joins us just ahead.
Quick headlines now. Facebook is making changes to your news feed. Over the next few weeks, users will see more status updates from friends and family and fewer viral videos and news articles. The move's intended to maximize the amount of content with more, quote, meaningful interaction, close quote. And you could soon find out exactly how much your dog loves you. Hi there. <gasps> Did that dog just say hi there? Oh, yes. My name is Doug. I have just met you, and I love you. <laughs> uh, that, is, uh, that is my cousin, but those are my dogs. Scientists are working on artificial intelligence that can translate your pet sounds and expressions so I can understand Rocky and Apollo sometime in the next 10 years. Why? And there's Rocky. That's the Aww. torso of my daughter. That's great. <laughs> All right. Uh, meanwhile, switching gears, we've got some disturbing video showing a hospital patient apparently dumped by security guards in freezing temperatures at a Baltimore, Maryland bus stop. Apparently, stranding people like this isn't unusual for American hospitals. Amber Miller from our Fox affiliate in Baltimore is live at the hospital where it happened. Amber? That's right. We're standing right across the street from the University of Maryland Medical Center Midtown campus. And this is where everything unfolded right along the sidewalk right here where we're showing you right now. The University of Maryland Medical Center's chief saying in this particular case, they absolutely failed to show basic humanity and compassion and an internal investigation is underway. Imamu Baraka, that is the man who recorded this video. He posted it on Facebook and called 911 to get the woman help. He is a psychotherapist right here in Baltimore, and he says that night he had just walked out of his office, which sits across the street from the hospital, when he saw everything unfold. He says initially he didn't think anything was strange, but when the wind blew and the woman's hospital gown rose, he realized she didn't have any clothes on underneath. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Are you freaking kidding me? They discarded this human being like she was trash. At a news conference yesterday, the president and CEO of the University of Maryland Medical Center apologized to the woman as well as her family, issuing this statement. It says, we feel comfortable in the statement that what you saw in that video is not a process that would occur with any frequency at all. Once again, an internal investigation is underway. Back to you. All right, Amber, thanks for the live report. from Wow. Back. Disturbing. No kidding. Um, thanks to the president's tax plan, the owner of this car dealership is passing on the savings to his employees. He joins us live next. But first, let's check live with Sandra Smith for a preview of what happens on the channel in nine minutes and 50 seconds. Happy Friday morning you. to you all. Well, deal or no deal, an immigration showdown. The week started with that bipartisan bicameral meeting in the White House, seemed to make progress. Then it ends with some salty language and no deal. The president calling it a big step backwards in a tweet this morning. A January 19th budget deadline is quickly approaching. So what is the president's next move? We've got Mike Huckabee, Rand Paul, Mercedes Schlapp, Chris Wallace. All join us in an all-star lineup. America's Newsroom begins top of the hour. The president must be exhausted. He has just sent out another tweet. Uh, keep in mind, this is all based on the fact that a uh, big news story on a lot of channels last night was that during that DACA meeting where the Democrats and Republican senators presented the president a plan he didn't like, he was frustrated, he referred to a nation as something, a word we're not going to use. He has tweeted about an hour ago, he never used that language, but now he's followed up with another tweet regarding apparently what he's seen on some other channels. Right, and that tweet says, never said anything derogatory about Haitians other than Haiti is obviously a very poor and troubled country. Never said, quote, take them out. Made up by Dems. I have a wonderful relationship with the Haitians. Probably should record future meetings. Unfortunately, no trust. So, wow. He probably should have known he can't trust them. Well, uh, as Ben Shapiro said earlier, 15 hours later, if the president uh, felt as it was being misreported, it would have helped uh, our show in particular to get his point of view earlier. But uh, uh, Lindsey Graham, Senator Tom Cotton, Senator Dick Durbin, Senator Jeff Flake, uh, Senator um, uh, Cory Gardner, all in there. So they're going to either back him up 
or, or, or push back? Because the original source for the Washington Post was two unnamed sources who apparently were briefed on what was said. We don't know whether it was a Republican or a Democrat that uh, ultimately led the Washington Post to run that story. But nonetheless, uh, now the president is doubling down. He said it was not the language he used, and he didn't tell anybody. But you're uh, right, Brian. I mean, and if he didn't say it, he should have said it 15 hours ago. Right. Uh, but they did have an official statement just saying, essentially, the president, uh, he came back. They didn't deny it in the statement that followed up last That's night. That's right. And ultimately, what he was uh, apparently frustrated about was that uh, this group of six bipartisan senators brought to him to his desk. He said, they said, Mr. President, you asked for a plan. We've got a plan. He took a look at it. He said, well, that's only 10 percent of the wall, which I want. And these other things, you're getting a good deal because the dreamers are going to wind up with a path to citizenship, but I'm not getting what I want. Right. And ultimately, he was frustrated, according to the initial report. But I think it's important to know that this is a deal. This is what mm -hmm. you. This is what they wanted. They wanted bipartisan work. So Democrats got more of the first proposal, not acceptable. Let's see if there'll be another. January 19th is a spending bill. That's when it's got to be done by, or else we all run out of money.